I'd like to introduce Stan Nelson, who's going to be doing our presentation today on uh, his study of Duchenne Connect data, looking at the identification of effective therapies and observation of disease severity. Very good. Uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, <laughs> very pleased to, uh, to be here on, in virtual presentation mode, um, presenting about the Duchenne uh, Connect data and some of the interpretations that we can make from this. I just wanted to start by, you know, thanking the, the staff at Dijen Connect for making this possible and Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy for also making sort of the, the, the web-based registry of information viable and making the data uh, freely available for interpretation. So I'm Stan Nelson. I'm co-director of the Center for Dijen Muscular Dystrophy. You can like us on Facebook. Um, I'm at UCLA. And uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about is collaborative research and really participatory research where with web tools and direct access by uh, the affected community with sufficient information to allow some interpretations to be made, we can make fantastic project uh, really as a team. So it requires uh, a web-based information that can accept information from people uh, in distributed locations and do that on an ongoing basis. It requires collecting sufficient data that you can start to interpret it, and then it requires uh, some folks that are willing to wrap their heads around what this data might mean and how it might influence where we're going to move forward. So I'm going to walk you through what it is that we've done in looking at some of the Descent Connect uh, data. So So Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy are uh, X-linked diseases. They're caused by mutations in the same uh, disease gene. Duchenne was described about 150 years ago, and Becker more recently described. Uh, it has the distinction of being one of the very first cloned disease genes um, over 20 years ago and is one of the most common genetic disorders. And there should be about 12,000 affected people in the United States at any one instant. And... Uh, that's relatively stable. One of the chains is, of course, that there's relatively minimal known effective therapies, and it's relatively difficult disease to perform clinical trials in, partly because even though it's a common genetic disorder, it's still a relatively rare disease. So organizing those clinical trials can still be a daunting. So this is a view of what the muscle cell surface looks like. All the little yellow balls are the, the, the membrane of each individual myofiber. And outside, uh, the, uh, there's a set of adhesion molecules mediated by surface sugars that are connected to the inside contractile apparatus through uh, dystrophin. So dystrophin is a long linear molecule, and it binds to F-actin at the yellow domains where it says ABD, and then it has this longer filamentous-like portion that then binds to the cell surface. Um, and uh, is responsible for some of the structural rigidity. And as we all know, it's generally completely missing, uh, leading to Duchenne muscular dystrophy on the next uh, slide. So the downstream consequences of that are obviously quite substantial. So I'm going to pull a little bit of data from not Duchenne Connect data, but I think it's just putting these things in perspective from U.S.-derived uh, population data. So these are... CDC data that were published by Richard Finkel and uh, Kennison just uh, a couple years ago. And from looking through the data, one can reinterpret it a bit. And the blue is all of the Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy diagnoses and the age at uh, death from those individuals. And the red is all other muscular dystrophies. And it's quite apparent that there's a staggering proportion of the mortality from all muscular dystrophies is due to mutations in the DMD gene causing Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, indicating that we need to really focus on this group. If you plot those data, separating them out in five-year bins with uh, ending in 1985, which is the darker blue line, and 2005, which is the lighter blue line, some of the optimistic uh, aspects are that even from this uh, uh, mortality data, that the, the age is shifting to be uh, older age groups 
due to better ventilatory care, perhaps better cardiomyopathy care, perhaps better skeletal uh, muscle preservation for a longer period of time and better organized management. And the open question is, are there things that uh, we're doing that we don't necessarily recognize that we're doing that are modulating the disease process that we can learn from looking at data in Mission uh, Connect? So clearly, supportive care in terms of supporting uh, respiratory issues, uh, physical therapy are clearly very important. Cardiac care, um, you know, managing the, the heart failure that's uh, relatively common in the population is clearly important. Uh, various medications, steroids are clearly having a beneficial impact in aggregate and in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, ACE inhibitors are clearly an effective component of the therapy for cardiomyopathy and look like they have a protective effect in the development of cardiomyopathy. Although I think as people look closer and closer, the, the cardiomyopathy really exists very early on. An open question is, are there other factors? There's many, many clinical trials published for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and many of them are relatively small. They're over relatively short periods of time, partly because those clinical trials are, are quite expensive to do, and they're quite expensive to do well. There are many of us, families affected, who have uh, their children on antioxidant therapies, uh, various vitamin or nutritional supplements, and do we really know what sort of a role they play? Are they beneficial? Or are they harmful? Do we really know? Is there any information? And so this is going to be an attempt at trying to wring out from uh, the, the relatively large group of people participating in Duchenne Connect to say, what can we observe are the effects on skeletal muscle function? And can we do this you know, basically for, for on the cheap, shall we say, so that we can have the model for keeping doing this heading into the future? This next slide is one uh, cold from uh, Shen Connect data, which is indicating that this is fairly early on, actually soon after it was uh, launched, but this is of people that were participating in Duchenne Connect, so people who logged on right away, and the question was, uh, is the affected person currently participating in a clinical trial or study, if, uh, even if it's a non-treatment, just observational study? And 85% answered no. So that's obviously something for us to work on as a community to have much more vigorous uh, participation in clinical trials and be available for those. But one of the things that it makes it very apparent is that there's a lot of people who are uh, potentially able to contribute quite useful data who are not participating in what we think of as a typical clinical, medical, uh, scientific uh, investigation. And yet they are participating in Duchenne Connect. And so there's a large, most of the data is that sort. So this is uh, a snapshot taken from uh, the Duchenne Connect Registry for information that's provided by uh, Holly PA and the team there. And this is actually a little bit uh, out of date. I didn't uh, update it. There's a recent uh, paper published about the Duchenne Connect Registry in uh, PLOS uh, Currents, which you can look up. Uh, but at this time, uh, when we were do generating the data for what I'm going to show you today, there were uh, 2,285 uh, participants and 1,396 individuals who indicated that they had the diagnosis of Duchenne. 960 of them, 968 of them resided in the United States. Um, and of the overall set, uh, uh, 898 were still walking. Uh, a large number were uh, previous and current steroid users, 769. The mean age at which people had registered was 14.6 years, and overall the mean age of diagnosis was about 4.8 years for the overall group. Most of the data is for individuals who have a diagnosis of Duchenne, uh, which is and then will typically be males affected by Duchenne, uh, which is consistent with what we know about uh, the frequency of Duchenne and Becker and uh, manifesting carriers, and et cetera. So one of the things in the lower right-hand panel is the current age of participants. So of, of 1,503 uh, participants that were in this graph, it would indicate that about 20 to 25% of uh, 
children that are in the 9 to 11 year age group are participating. So that's fantastic. But the participation rates of slightly older kids, uh, 12 to 14, 15 to 17, uh, 18 to 20, 21 to 23, is decreasing. Um, and that's a really critical group to try to get to participate. So after the age, generally, of uh, loss of ambulation, that's a group of individuals that would be really quite lovely to include in the sorts of studies that I'll that I walk through. So one open question is, do the data, uh, is the data that uh, Duchenne Connect is accumulating, is it representative of what we know of uh, is the distribution of, say, mutations or age of onset or severity of Duchenne in uh, the published literature. So we know a lot of information about the Shen muscular dystrophy. And if we restrict ourselves to the, the Shen Connect DMD mutations, which is on the left, the mutational spectrum, that is the, the proportion of all of the mutations that are deletions versus the portions that are small uh, point mutations versus the portion that are small duplications or large duplications, is very consistent with I chose an arbitrary published data set from a, from, a, from a population sampling on the right, where you can look at multitudes of such things, and from natural history studies and from published mutation theories, uh, what's reported in Duchenne Connect matches very well with what's in the literature. It's also, so that, that's a good sign that we're doing a good job of sampling from, uh, uh, from the population of folks with, with Duchenne. There's a very similar age of diagnosis. So an MD StarNet uh, study was published recently surveying across a handful of states in a very thorough population-centric fashion. The mean age of diagnosis was 4.9 years, and that's a very carefully done study. And uh, this information is gathered from all of those participating, and the mean age of diagnosis was 4.8 years across the overall data set. So very consistent with, again, a, a, an academic uh, study. Similarly, the age at wheelchair use for the overall population in Duchenne Connect matches very well with what's been in a series of different uh, natural history studies. So at first glance, the data looks very good, looks like one could rely on using this, and that's important because if we had strong biases in who was participating, the interpretation of the data may be much more suspect and much more difficult to apply to uh, 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 others that are not necessarily uh, uh, participating in this. So I want to now walk you through how it is that we're going to interpret the information from the Shen Connect in order to try to grapple with, can we interpret uh, uh, the effect of selected therapies from individuals and what that's doing to skeletal muscle function? So to do that, we're going to use the reported age at wheelchair use as a measure of disease severity. So if a child is using a wheelchair at age 7 per the report, um, they would be given a score of 7. If a child is using, started to use a wheelchair at age 14, they'd be relatively more mildly affected. And then what we're going to look at is what's the age at wheelchair use in different treatment groups or different self-reported treatment groups and can we observe any functional benefits? Can we infer any functional benefit from that? So we're going to compare a series of different drugs and supplement usages and assess that correlation with age at wheelchair use. We can control as well because many people take more than one supplement, more than one drug, and so we can control for the multiple different combinations using multivariate analysis, which I'm not going to go into here but uh, rest assured that it's part of the underlying uh, analysis. And I'm just going to show it to you in a way that I think is, is easier, uh, it's easier for me, at least to understand and think through. So one of the things that's a good advantage of these data is actually the largest cohort for such interpretation of individuals that are past the age of uh, ambulation, such that we can look at this very critical milestone and determine what the effect was of, of various therapies, although it is retrospective, and it is not uh, tightly controlled, certainly, and we don't necessarily know precise information about drug dosages, regimens, length of therapies. So, say, obviously, 
uh, some of these interpretations are uh, uh, provocative, but not necessarily definitive. So what sort of drugs do people use that have registered in Duchenne uh, Connect? So of, the DM, so of all of the patients uh, registered in, um, in Duchenne Connect who are past the age of ambulation, um, who, have, who are male, who have a strong uh, likelihood of truly having uh, Duchenne, there are 384 patients that are after the age of wheelchair use. And then of those individuals, 189 of those people are taking an ACE inhibitor of some ilk or losartan, which is closely related. 159 report that they are uh, previous and current users of steroids, typically prednisone or uh, deflazacort and some on prednisolone. Uh, 87 take vitamin D. Uh, 81 take calcium. 50 take coenzyme Q. And then the, of the people who are self-reporting information, there's a much rarer use of all of the rest of these uh, medications, which interferes a bit with our interpretation. So one of the, my messages is that had we had larger participation of people, each one of these categories would go up substantially, and we can meaningfully interpret them and get statistically meaningful results, which may indeed prompt uh, appropriate uh, therapeutic uh, trials. If you look down at the bottom, if, if, if people reported that they never took any supplements and they never took any of the drugs listed above, the mean age of wheelchair use is 9.6 uh, years um, for that whole group, and there's 136 such individuals. And they're, in effect, serving as the control group for interpretation. So this is the flow of all of the data that we've filtered from the Shen Connect. So out of 2,285 individuals registered at uh, Duchenne Connect, uh, 1,396 have a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Of those, they come from a variety of different countries. Um, and 1,164 are from uh, what I've uh, restricted to be um, a European Western types of uh, 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 medical systems, and those are the subset that we looked at. We're doing that for homo uh, sort of, uh, homogenization of the data. It doesn't matter much if we include all of the patients in for the interpretation. We also exclude anybody who's a female or any answers that are given that may give us uh, uh, questions about the clarity of the diagnosis. So there's a subset of those individuals that are re removed as well. So it's only males from uh, mostly the U.S. with a, re a clear diagnosis of Duchenne. And with that, the age of diagnosis of this particular group is, is closer to four years of age in aggregate. So uh, from those, we also do a further filtering. There are some individuals that are very strong outliers, um, and we've taken those out because we didn't want them to interfere with the statistical analysis. We've also then further removed all of the individuals for most of the analyses who are not uh, wheelchair users. So there are 711 of those individuals that were uh, removed from the primary analyses that we'll walk through. So look at this remaining set. Well, now we're down to just 384 individuals. And of those 384 individuals, the mean age at which a wheelchair was used is 10 and a half years. And now from within that group, we can ask, uh, were they taking ACE inhibitors like Prendipril, uh, for typically for cardiomyopathy prevention or alternatively for uh, cardiomyopathy treatment? Were they taking steroids? Which steroid were they taking and what type of regimen were they using? Were they taking vitamins or supplements um, like vitamin D, calcium, and coenzyme Q? And then we can try to interpret those data. So this is what the overall distribution at age at wheelchair use looks like from Duchenne Connect. Uh, this fits uh, rather well with uh, prior information and natural history studies. And so the mean age is 10 and a half uh, years. Age is along the bottom. And then the, um, uh, the number of boys that have lost ambulation at each of the ages is, uh, is, is, is this graphic. So this is fundamentally where all the raw data comes from for these interpretations.
So to test this out, one step to do is take steroids. So there are a large number of studies done with steroids, some small studies, some relatively large studies. Consistently, uh, the studies have indicated that steroids have a beneficial effect on skeletal muscle function. Uh, they also have other beneficial effects as observed in long-term use. But at fairly typical doses of prednisone or typical doses of deflazacort, um, this Sorry, the people have questions. No. Uh, yeah, Sam, we'll, we'll oh, get, I think the questions are for uh, things that are coming. So um, why don't you go ahead and continue for a couple more slides. Maybe we can then take a few questions. Perfect. That would be great because I, one popped up into my eye when I was uh, chatting. Um, so so for the – let's just go through what – can we observe the – the beneficial effect of steroids that's reported in the medical literature and observe this within the Duchenne Connect registry of a comparable scale. So this is a slide taken from a Cochrane report published in 2008, which very convincingly goes through the data indicating that indeed steroids have this positive beneficial muscle effect, which is the reason that they're much more commonly prescribed now than they were uh, 20 and 10 years ago. And the the Duchenne Connect data do observe this steroid effect. So out of the individuals, uh, there are some people who are previous users of steroids, and we took those out. So here we're just going to show you the never used steroids, and there were 107 such observations. And the current steroid users, this is previous and current users, um, and the, the difference, the statistical difference between these is it's a shift of about 1.3 years in the age of ambulation. And this is statistically significant um, between these two different groups. So there's very low likelihood that steroid use and non-steroid use are equivalent. So it's been favoring steroid usage. And the distribution of those uh, two uh, groups is shown below. So, of course, there's many people who use steroids who end up having a relatively severe disease course. And there's some individuals who never use steroids who end up having a relatively mild course. But as two separate populations, they're clearly uh, uh, different and indicate that the, the effect of steroids can be observed within the Duchenne Connect uh, data. The next slide is looking at this. This is all the uh, many of the people that we're not including in these analyses, and this is what's called a Kaplan-Meier analysis. And at age uh, uh, two and a half, 100 percent of kids are, are ambulatory. And then by age uh, 20, 20 uh, 21, virtually no one is ambulatory. And this is of the population, the fraction of the population that's remaining ambulatory. So the red line is never having taken steroids in the report. And the black line is current steroid users. And this is giving you a stronger flavor of how big the, the effect of steroids is, adding uh, uh, you know, two to four years of, uh, of ambulation in aggregate across these populations. We can also ask about the corticosteroid usage. Is the flazacort observed to be superior to prednisone in terms of uh, age of ambulation? There is a modestly significant p-value favoring deflazacort. There were 82 uses of deflazacort versus 77 uses of prednisone with a uh, shift in wheelchair age favoring deflazacort. And this is uh, uh, significant, but not, not highly significant. And looking down below, at the, the deflazacort and prednisone are most commonly given as a daily dose regimen. That's the most uh, uh, supported regimen in the literature. But many are, don't tolerate that well, and they end up being on alternate week regimen or alternate day regimen. There's a variety of different uh, options. Relatively few of those individuals there's no statistically significant change within those, but there is, um, uh, so in, in, in some ways that would argue for the fact that they may be equivalent or alternatively that we just simply don't have enough power to observe the difference. So the flazacort is trending towards alternate regimens are, uh, were superior in the 11 patients observed and the prednisone is trending the opposite direction that the alternate regimens were behaving worse. So this, um, and then uh, just finishing up on the uh, uh, steroid 
uh, issue is that the Plaza Court was originally proposed uh, decades ago as being a bone-sparing um, glucocorticoid, and there's in mixed information in the literature about whether it really does prefer, uh, preserve bone mineral density better or not. But what's, what's uh, interesting from these data is there is no difference in the frequency of broken uh, bones between these two different groups. This might be a good time to stop for questions. Is that uh, good, Danielle, Holly? Yes, that's great. Yes, that's fine. Yep. Right. Okay, so we have a couple um, questions from the group. And uh, first, I, I would just like to say we got all excited and ran right over our intro. So um, I'd like to just say, as the manager of the Duchenne Connect Registry, how incredibly excited I am that you all are hearing this information about the registry and to share with the group one of the, the primary questions that I get about the registry, which is um, how accurate the patient-reported data is. So whether the parents and the individuals with Duchenne are able to accurately put in information that can be used by researchers in this sort of way. And it's extremely uh, reassuring and lovely to have Sam's data that shows that, based on the data we have in our registry, that uh, – it, uh, that it is representative, meaning that the people who register and put information in are very similar to other people and other populations where generally a physician enters the data. So that's a, a very powerful message, and I just want to reinforce to you the um, really the power of families entering their own data and what great information we can get back from the data you enter. Yeah, I, w I would echo that. I think it's, it's very compelling that it matches well with the natural history data that have been collected. That's spectacular. Okay. All so, right, so I probably shouldn't um, hog the mic here because we do have lots of questions. So um, I'll just sort of go through and put out a few. So one of the questions is Stan asking about types of mutation and and whether you've been able to look at these data um, about ambulation and steroid use based on genetic mutation. Yeah. So the, uh, there are a few mutations that are predicting a relatively more severe course in terms of loss of ambulation. Uh, given the spectrum of mutations that occur, though, there's relatively few in any individual category. So the single most common mutation is the deletion of exon 45, uh, that's a relatively common individual discrete mutation. Um, and that, uh, that group is, is somewhat more heterogeneous than the remainder of the sample. But in general, there, um, uh, I won't go into that much here, but we'll, we'll look at this issue better over time. But at the core point is that uh, there are some mutations which can predict a slightly milder course and others that can predict a profoundly more mild course, which, of course, are, you know, in-frame mutations. Some of the areas that we know about already, uh, early uh, actin binding domain, you know, early exon uh, uh, deletion duplications can sometimes have a more heterogeneous uh, course as well. So I'd say at least that one, I would say, uh, will, be, will be explored and uh, no incredibly strong things to report that are uh, – uh, wildly uh, unexpected. Yeah, and, and I think just to put in a plug here that the more people who register and the more people who send in their genetic information so that we can curate it, the better we can answer those exact kinds of questions. So um, if you're a parent or someone with Duchenne or Becker muscle dystrophy, please do put that information in your profile and send us in your results so that we can curate them in that way that allows us to do that sort of analysis. Absolutely. Uh, the other way I would echo that is particularly beneficial is uh, children, uh, young adults that are past the age of ambulation, accumulating their information is a very precious uh, resource of this sort of information because they've already spent, unfortunately, they've already sort of spent the time uh, having the disease progress, and that's a particularly valuable group to include here for those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can teach us a lot. Okay. So we have another question about... Uh, it's just a clarification, I'm asking you to, again, talk about the alternate dose, alternate dose of Duflazacort and whether that may, in fact, be equal or better than the daily regimen. Could you 
go over that again? There was a question about it. Yeah, so this is um, – I'll just bring that slide back up. So there, uh, there's a, um, a, a paper from uh, Diana Escalar looking at this issue about the equivalency of uh, of an alternate dosing regimen that may cause less growth suppression and less of the suppression of the adrenal cortical uh, hormones that we all uh, normally need to make. When we're on daily dosing of prednisone or daily dosing of diplazicord, they're at doses that exceed what our body needs of our natural cortisol, and so that's completely suppressed. Alternate dosing regimens are intended to allow the body to, uh, in a sense, recover. It's still an open question whether these alternate dosing regimens. Uh, I had to group these other dosing regimens all together. So some of these are every other day. Some are 10 days on and 10 days off, and others um, actually didn't report exactly what they were. They just said they weren't on uh, the daily dosing. I would take these data with a grain of salt because there's so few instances. And from a statistical point of view, I would, I would store it as we don't have enough information yet to declare that alternate dosing regimens for diplastic or, or prednisone is sufficient. That's my takeaway there. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, to reinforce that this data allows us to ask very interesting research questions um, that we can then go on and delve into deeper. So it's very interesting to see that even turn that way. Absolutely. I I expected the daily dosing to clearly be superior to all of these alternate dosing regimens, and I'm surprised that it's not. So I'll just give you that. That's my, uh, that's my gestalt from this. Mm-hmm. So there's a question about growth hormone and steroids and whether we have the ability to answer any questions about the benefit of growth hormone based on the data that we have. Uh, the answer is no, we don't have sufficient data. There's not enough kids who happen to be on growth hormone who have reported in the registry that they're on growth hormone who have gone past the age of wheelchair use so that I could include them. There were just, uh, there were just a couple, two or three individuals, so there's not enough data. Okay. Um, a, well, uh, we have a lot of questions, so I'm going to ask a couple more, and then we'll move on and get to a couple more at the end. So I have one question about uh, whether you were able to examine the data related to the age of steroids started and how that age of starting may affect uh, the, the, the results. Spectacular question. So I think one of the things that we need to do a better job of, and uh, it's one of the things that the advisory board and Deshen Connect itself will work on, is accumulating more fine granularity information. So one of the things that uh, we would hope to provoke from this is enthusiasm about participating, but also uh, collecting a little bit more information. It won't be quite as simple, won't be quite as easy, but uh, collecting information about exactly when did the steroids start, uh, were they ever interrupted, what's the cumulative dose, and we can do those sorts of things in a better flow. We don't know that yet here. So that's a, that's a gap, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And and it, it's a very it's a it's a fantastic question, and one of the things that you know all of the parents with very young kids and all the physicians who are treating kids with young kids is really when to start steroids. If you have a diagnosis at age one, will you start age four? Probably, I think you should. But you know, it, it's going to be quite uh, heterogeneous for what people do until there's clear guidance. Um, more, more data more data is good there. Mm-hmm. right and and one of the fun things that's come out of this is uh Stan is on our advisory committee we've been working on ways we can update our profile the survey that that you all fill out so that we can actually make it even more informative so you will see a change over probably the next uh, maybe six months of more specific questions coming up in the survey that will help us take the next step with this data yeah that's very exciting. Yeah. Okay, we do have a couple more questions, but I wonder, Stan, if you want to ca- tackle them now or if you want to go ahead and continue and then we'll get them toward the end. Oh, perfect. Uh, let me let me go uh, – let me keep going on because I think it will – perhaps some of the questions might be answered in the context of uh, showing what we can do in terms of the interpretation. So, so on this uh, slide – these are the numbers of individuals that have 
chosen or been prescribed uh, but are willing to take and have taken various uh, cardiomyopathy medications. So perindopril are similar as ACE inhibitors, uh, perindopril, lisinopril, and allopril, um, and losartan is grouped over there as well. Uh, supplements, there's a number of individuals who've taken vitamin D, calcium, coenzyme Q, vitamin C, vitamin E, magnesium. Uh, some individuals have taken melatonin, creatine, uh, protandum as an one form of uh, antioxidant and vitamin A. And then we can start to look at these data separated by uh, steroid usage. So of all 384 individuals, there are about 150 individuals who are currently using the Flazicort or prednisone. And then of those individuals, we can ask, is there any additional positive benefit of supplements? And there's fairly strong evidence that calcium, vitamin D, coenzyme Q are strongly correlated with uh, a longer age, of higher age of ambulation, and that uh, the creatine monohydrate, of which is very few instances, and protandum are trending in that direction uh, as well, but there's just few observations. So uh, let's, so one of the interesting things, I think, is uh, the effect of ACE inhibitors on the possibility of improving skeletal muscle function. So there's a very interesting mouse paper from uh, uh, Dr. Raphael Fortney's laboratory at, uh, uh, from Columbus, Ohio. And in that paper, she was indicating that uh, there may be some skeletal muscle benefits, and there's other mouse data to, to support this as well, of, in the MDX mouse, of using uh, some of these drugs not just for the heart protection, but maybe for skeletal muscle protection. Kids and adults are, typic are commonly taking ACE inhibitors, and much of this is provoked from a couple of papers from a French group by the book, indicating that um, early intervention at age 10, before the age of frank cardiomyopathy, may be cardioprotective. And indeed, there's uh, data from uh, Ohio State as well indicating that um, early use of lisinopril is beneficial, um, but typically uh, early on in the process of developing the cardiomyopathy. So, but because of these, these French data, many, many individuals get uh, on ACE inhibitors well prior to the age of cardiomyopathy. So we have the advantage of trying to look at this effect, and can we observe any beneficial effect? So there are 196 individuals um, taking an ACE inhibitor, and I must have a typo in there, 199 not taking an ACE inhibitor. The various ACE inhibitors are listed off on the left, and the difference between the group taking ACE inhibitors on age and ambulation is about a year. This is statistically significant between these two different categories, and it could be that all of the people who are taking ACE inhibitors because they care to put their kids on ACE inhibitors early, are also all taking uh, prednisone or deflazacort, and therefore they're tending to walk longer because it's just an effect of the steroids. So you're just happening to take both at the same time. But if you look down below in the red box, if we restrict the analysis only to those individuals that are reporting that they're current steroid users, and then ask amongst the sets that are not taking ACE inhibitors versus the sets that are taking ACE inhibitors, and restrict to that comparison, there's a substantial improvement in the age of ambulation, uh, even within the current steroid user group, indicating that there's an additive effect of these ACE inhibitors from these data. So that's actually uh, very exciting uh, to me and matches well with what the mouse uh, data uh, are indicating. Uh, it was also brought to my attention from uh, Lee Sweeney that perhaps Losartan won't work because it's working through a slightly different mechanism, but lisinopril might work. And so is there any difference between these different types of ACE inhibitors? So it turns out that losartan and lisinopril are a couple of the most common ACE uh, inhibitor-like drugs, and they're not statistically significant for these 11.4 uh, years for losartan and 11.1 years for lisinopril, um, but there's no, uh, no evidence that losartan is, is worse than uh, lisinopril. Again, we don't know the exact doses that anybody's using for these, so we're assuming folks are doing uh, in, in the ballpark of what, uh, what uh, reasonable clinical judgment would, would indicate, so fairly typical doses of losartan or fairly typical doses of lisinopril. 
Uh, there's no significant difference. Both are beneficial for the skeletal muscle effect. We can then look across all of these different supplements and just simply ask, is there an observed uh, increase in the age of wheelchair use um, amongst the different uh, types of, 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 of treatments used? So ACE inhibitors are beneficial. Corticosteroids are beneficial. Uh, vitamin D is beneficial. Calcium is beneficial. And coenzyme Q is beneficial. And uh, interest, the others are not, uh, they're all trending towards being uh, beneficial in this particular table, but they're not statistically significant, uh, largely because there's uh, insufficient observation. Uh, per tandem is, is poking out to be, you know, trending strongly towards being uh, beneficial, indicating potentially a role for antioxidant uh, therapy in the disease as, as has been postulated over the years. We can then again ask the question is, are these data confounded by the co-administration of steroids? So we can restrict the analyses. If you look on the right-hand side of this, the current steroid users and ask, is calcium beneficial uh, amongst current steroid users uh, who are taking calcium versus not taking calcium? And indeed, it has a statistically significant beneficial effect, as is vitamin D. And if you're taking uh, calcium and vitamin D, that's, of course, uh, statistically significant. Most people who are taking one are taking the other, and that is, uh, uh, you know, so these, these two are relatively confounded by each other, but each one looks like it's, uh, it's a predictor of uh, longer age of ambulation. This is the data for coenzyme uh, Q, and, and with coenzyme Q, it's statistically significant that if you're taking coenzyme Q and steroids, you uh, walk longer than if you take uh, steroids alone and do not take uh, coenzyme uh, Q. And this is a, an alternate view of this, and it's just the way I conceptualize it and, and think about it. So if you think about, you know, is there evidence that combinations of these different therapies are beneficial, the answer is yes. So all of the data that I showed you uh, keep supporting the idea that it's not doing one therapy versus another therapy. It's really the cumulative beneficial effect of each one of these. So that if you, if in this data set one does, uh, uh, individuals choose to do no therapy whatsoever, they don't use steroids, they don't take any of the medications, not ACE inhibitors and not any supplements. The mean age of loss of ambulation is 9.42 years in that group. And the mean age of the overall group is 10.4 years. If you're taking the flazacort or prednisone, the mean age of ambulation is at 11.18 years, and there's a substantial group of those individuals, which is why it's statistically uh, strong. And then if you're on uh, the flazacort or prednisone and you've also been on ACE inhibitors, uh, the age of loss of ambulation increases to about 12 years of age for those uh, children. Then of those children, uh, a subset of those individuals are also taking vitamin D and calcium and coenzyme Q, and each one of those keep increasing the age at which ambulation is uh, lost. Uh, vitamin C, there's only four individuals taking it, but uh, they were uh, a relatively uh, good group, as were the subset, which were also taking creatine monohydrate and pretandem. Those are not statistically significant. The other three, calcium, vitamin D, and coenzyme Q, were um, interestingly, Catherine Wagner uh, is a terrific physician involved in taking care of kids with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, suggested that perhaps vitamin D and calcium are beneficial simply because the bones are a little bit stronger and the group that are taking the vitamin D and calcium are being protected from broken bones. So Duchenne Connect actually has this information collected from all of the participants, and there's no significant decrease in broken bones amongst the uh, loss of ambulation group, taking vitamin D and calcium. So that does not appear to be the easy explanation for why these are, these are beneficial. So this would make an inferred regimen, which uh, uh, clearly the majority of patients are not on this that are reported, but this would imply that certainly if it's tolerated to flazacort and or prednisone, uh, should be used. ACE inhibitors potentially at an earlier age than um, 
would be suggested would be quite rational to be using, vitamin D, calcium supplementation, coenzyme Q supplementation, potentially vitamin C, not really strong evidence of that simply from the numbers. Uh, creatine uh, is suggested as an antioxidant. So that would be a proposed regimen of, uh, of, of, of supplements as extracted from the current uh, data. So if you, if you do, you know, if we, if we look at a plot of the disease severity as measured by the age at loss of ambulation, so the steroid uh, usage is in the blue, and if you do no supplements, no therapies, you're in the red, this is quite significantly uh, shifted from about nine years to uh, 11 years. But even within each one of these groups, the distribution of how people are affected is substantial, right? So these modifications, these these ways that we can modulate the disease process and the fact that they add together is fantastic. So that's great. But it doesn't explain necessarily why the kids uh, uh, necessarily can, can behave quite uh, differently. And it may be that other uh, genetic variants are playing a role in that that are yet to be uh, determined. I just wanted to share a couple of other quick uh, observations. Uh, that are sort of supporting the idea that this Duchenne Connect data is quite useful for, for mining and looking at. So this is a clinical paper indicating uh, steroid treated is on the right, non-treated is on the left, and it's the degree of scoliosis indicating that those who are on chronic steroid therapy are having a much less uh, frequency of scoliosis, and this is observed uh, clinically that it's the frequency of kids needing scoliosis surgery is, is decreasing in the era of a larger number of kids being on prednisone or deflazacort. And if you break this down from the Duchenne Connect data of non-steroid users, so the 107 kids that are post-loss of ambulation, 39% have either had scoliosis surgery or severe enough or they're planning surgery versus only 6 or 11% on deflazacort or <clears throat> prednisone. And there's not sufficient numbers to be declaring that deflazacort has a lower frequency of needing scoliosis surgery. That's the trend in these data. But these are sorts of things that, as we accumulate more data, we can do this very efficiently. And that's actually uh, quite exciting. So uh, I can take a few questions, but my conclusions are that this is a spectacularly useful uh, resource. I think a lot of the questions that people will ask, the answer will be more participation will allow us to better answer those questions. This is a substantial chunk of all of the individuals in the U.S. with the Shen muscular dystrophy. It's about 10% of the U.S. population has registered. 100% would be good, um, and we're there. It's a big enough population sample that we probably can't change some of the group aggregate sets, but if there are mutation-specific differences in these answers, we won't know that unless we have much uh, more complete participation and better data gathered over, over the years. So more data is going to be uh, very useful. I would just point out that uh, the team at Duchenne Connect is fantastic. We put this slide in so they can answer questions about genetic counseling and various research questions. They're a great resource for getting folks into clinical trials as we all get uh, various emails. So I put up Ann Martin's uh, contact information, email, telephone, and uh, the web address for Duchenne uh, Connect. Um, if you want to be connected to us at UCLA, you can like the Center for Descent Muscular Dystrophy at Facebook, and you're welcome to email me uh, questions as well. So I'm going to – the uh, – this work is really only possible to do because of the, uh, you know, the tremendous resource that's been set up. And now that this has been set up, it's fantastically possible to keep uh, growing this resource. Um, so I wanted to very much thank Holly P.A. and Vanessa Miller and Ann Martin and the other advisors for making this uh, possible, and PPMD for making this possible. And just down below, I would just highlight Asya Eskin, who's done the majority of the lifting for these analytical things that I was showing you. So, do you want to guide me through questions, Holly? Sure. Or? I'd be happy to. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, as you can imagine, after a, a product provocative um, presentation like this using our own data, there, there are lots of questions about dosing and ages to start and payment and access to supplements and ACE inhibitors. So I, to 
suspect I know the answer to that, but do you want to give the community some idea how you would respond to those sorts of questions? In terms of, you know, can we have insurers pay for some of these? Well, so, so uh, let's start with, with dosing and age to start. Is there data you can infer on those two points based on the Duchenne Connect data we have to date? Yeah. So I think we should do a better job of collecting that in Duchenne Connect, and then we can give a more specific answer. My, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of my uh, inference here, which is that I think most of the people that are on these medications are doing them based on the uh, uh, some published reports. So, for instance, creatine dosing is often given at 0.1 grams per kilo as a daily dosing, and I suspect that most of the people that are on creatine are on that dose or somewhere close to that dose. Um, and uh, the coenzyme Q, the study from Synergy indicated that very high doses were needed to maintain anything close to an effective dosing regimen. And the subset of clinicians who, who advocate coenzyme Q also realize that the absorption of it um, and the bioactivity of it can be quite variable. And so typically the doses have to be fairly high, 300 to 400 milligrams per day. And sometimes you need assistance with fat to get it absorbed well. And that's something that actually can be measured clinically. And some of the clinicians indeed do measure this uh, serum levels of, uh, of uh, 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 coenzyme Q. Mm -hmm. um, for the others, vitamin C, I have no idea. I, I don't know what people would be doing. Uh, vitamin D levels, of course, can be measured, and some of the clinicians do that and try to maintain the kids at a relatively high uh, serum vitamin D level. There's uh, various reports in adults and kids that many in the population may be uh, having a relatively lower vitamin D, so there's a lot of folks getting supplemented with vitamin D these days. So those ones can probably be pushed to fairly high doses and monitored for their effects. Calcium, I think, could be all over the map for how much supplementation, and it's probably something to do uh, in discussion with uh, nutritionists or physician to make sure that uh, one's not running a risk of, uh, of, uh, 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 of overdoing it. But in general, it's probably a modest uh, supplementation of calcium. Did I miss any? <laughs> no, I think you got them, and I, I think it, it sounds like a good message to be sending is that um, – we should encourage families to bring the inferred regimen to their health care provider and talk to them about whether whether they're they're appropriate for any particular child and at what dosing levels. Absolutely. And yeah. we will publish these results. So these will be out in the medical literature. They'll have been peer-reviewed, and it will be uh, so interpreted appropriately. So they will be out and about at some, you know, in the months ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, on sort of a similar note, we, we're getting a lot of questions from um, from academic and clinical folks who are listening in uh, about very specific information about the data, um, defining categories, and some of the descriptive data. And I'm going to happily answer those questions with Stan, but I'm going to ask that we can answer those questions offline for you. And again, the, the publication will be the ultimate uh, place where those those answers will come. Perfect. Yeah, and again, for the academic folks that are on, much of the fine level granularity is not available to us. Is, is the answer I can kind of peer up at some of these questions, like the duration of therapies. We don't know that yet necessarily. We can infer it from what's likely to be reasonable clinical practice, but we don't know it. So we're getting some reality check comments from some of the parents who are reminding us how expensive some of these supplements are and who are also reminding us how um, sometimes unenthusiastic uh, some of the boys are and young men are about taking this number of supplements. So I think that's an important thing for us to bear in mind, too. Do you have a particular thought about those items? I do, yeah. I would, yeah some kids are... are happy pill takers will take anything you put in front of them. Others are extremely resistant. Some have two-year-olds, which you're not going to get a pill into at all. Um, so it can be quite heterogeneous for when you could possibly start some subset of these things. Uh, my own uh, attitude is that if indeed these therapies are indeed therapies and are uh, truly well observed to be uh, prolonging ambulation and preserving skeletal muscle function, that that benefit 
especially as we're giving these to our children, uh, can, uh, even though it seems uh, tedious to need to take such a such a regimen, you know, I as a, as a parent would uh, would be would be doing it. And I think some subset of these things, we if we don't know that they're effective. It's very difficult to be enthusiastic about it, having your children do something that's at all unpleasant, even minor unpleasant. And I think that's where a lot of these are at the moment. But if there's reasonably strong evidence that they are beneficial, I think parents should have that information. Uh, it may also beg, you know, if indeed this regimen is, is efficacious and if some subset of things could all be combined into some sort of a more palatable, easy-to-take cocktail you know, that would be another direction to go in. Um, it may require some, uh, some some further proof to invest that level of energy. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I, I have sympathy for uh, for definitely, you know, some subsets of these things are, are much more difficult to do in, in younger kids in particular and, and older kids as well. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, we're running out of time, so I would like to make a couple of comments, and I think that um, actually Pat Furlong had a, a comment or two she wanted to make as well. So, again, thank you very much, Dan. That's been extremely uh, gratifying to me very personally to see the fruition of this data, and, I, again, I just cannot thank the families enough who've participated Um, I will encourage you to go look at the Duchenne Connect website at our 2011 annual report where you'll learn a lot more information about all of the ways the registry data has been used. This is a great example, but there are lots of other really nice examples of ways we've partnered with industry and other academic groups to push forward our understanding of Duchenne as well as push the clinical trial field forward, and it's, it's just incredibly exciting for us. Uh, so please do go look at our 2011 annual report online and see how much you've done with your participation. We also would love to hear from families as well as from other academic partners about uh, questions you have. Are there ways we can use this data to answer questions that you wonder about? And parents, you're as you know, more than welcome to approach us with questions that you've wondered and see if there are ways that we can answer those questions with the data. And if not, can we collect some additional data? Um, we have a lot of power in this registry, and we really want to engage the families as well as academic partners and our industry partners to make the most of it. It's a great resource. Um, so I'm going to pause for one moment and see, Pat Furlong, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Holly, I just wanted to thank Stan and to thank Duchenne Connect, you and Ann Martin. This is an incredible resource, and I, and I think as a community we have to realize that clinical trials are up to us. Right, because this information is going to be so useful in so many ways, both to understand Duchenne a bit better, to know what works or what would be useful in Duchenne, but also for industry so that they can learn and design trials that are best positioned to find out if a drug is going to be helpful to our boys. So in this case, this is where sometimes you get a diagnosis of Duchenne and you feel powerless, but in this particular case, clinical trials are our responsibility as community members And in order to participate in Duchenne Connect, this is where we can actively take a role that has a meaningful difference. So I wanted to say thank you again, Stan. This has been amazing. You all already know I was really sort of chomping at the bit to get some of this information out. So I'm really very thankful. Thank you all. Great. And just uh, to wrap up, I'd like to reinforce to everyone that this will be available um, as a presentation posted on PPMD's website, so everyone is welcome and encouraged to come back and look at these slides again. You have contact information for um, Stan, who provided it on, I think, one slide back, so it is there if you want to contact him directly. We also always welcome contacts at Duchenne Connect. Uh, Many of you have spoken before with Ann Martin, who is the Duchenne Connect coordinator, Um, and we are very happy to hear from you. So, again, thank you very much, Dan. It's been really enjoyable working with you, and I look forward to continuing to do so. Very good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your hard work. Thank you, everyone. Mm 